Hello, everyone, and welcome uh, to the Asia Society. I'm Tom Nagorski, Executive Vice President here. Welcome uh, to an event that is actually our first uh, in a new world of public events uh, that we're doing here at the Asia Society in New York uh, without an in-the-room audience. Um, and I probably don't need to tell our audience that as the coronavirus uh, makes its way uh, into uh, the United States and the New York area in particular, we have, along with a lot of other institutions, out of an abundance of caution, uh, moved all our events to webcast only. Uh, but we are still here, our great guests are still here, and the programming continues. Uh, tonight, a conversation about China, about its economy, and I think it's safe to say a somewhat unconventional look and a super interesting look. Uh, at what has been until very recently the unprecedented economic growth uh, in China. Uh, our guest tonight, Dexter Roberts, uh, was a Bloomberg reporter and bureau chief in Beijing for two decades, uh, covering economics, business, and politics in China. Uh, quite a time to be there, essentially covering one of the most remarkable economic transformations the world has ever known, even if he does call into question some of the uh, uh, results and consequences of that transformation. His book, which is just published this week, is called The Myth of Chinese Capitalism, The Worker, the Factory, and the Future of the World. Uh, it looks primarily, but not exclusively, at one family and two very different places in China, a manufacturing juggernaut home to the largest population of migrant workers in China, and then a less well-known place, a village in one of the poorest parts of the country, and in fact, a place that many natives leave, the migrants who actually do the migrating, uh, to become the workers in those big factory towns. And via those places and those workers, there are many overall takeaways. The main one being, as the title suggests, that behind the wild success, uh, which we at the Asia Society and the rest of the world have been watching for a long time now, uh, behind the wild success of Chinese capitalism, there are troubling signs, uh, and there are many losers along with the winners um, in that world. There are societal problems as well uh, now and looming. And of course, Dexter Roberts wrote his book before the coronavirus hit Wuhan, uh, the rest of China and the rest of the world. We'll talk a little bit about that. We were expecting, by the way, uh, to have in the chair I'm sitting in as moderator, uh, the great Chiang Fan, staff writer at The New Yorker. Uh, she has had, just so you know, an emergency in the family. Uh, that keeps her from being with us tonight. We send her all our best wishes. Uh, and Dexter Roberts, we welcome you uh, to the Asia Society. Great to have you. Thank you very much, Tom. So um, the word coronavirus uh, never appears in your book. It would be weird if it did. Um, but I thought I'd start there uh, with, and, and I also know you're, you're not a, a public health, you're not an epidemiologist. I am not. No, you are not. Uh, but there's a question that we have asked the epidemiologists and public health officials that I thought, given uh, your long experience in China, you probably have an opinion on anyway, which is uh, this sort of uh, pair of views, um, uh, binary look really at what's happened uh, since the virus and the outbreak struck uh, Wuhan and other parts of China as it did, which is on the one hand that uh, Boy, they did a, a phenomenal job. We had uh, the, the, the gentleman who led the delegation for the WHO to Wuhan recently uh, on a podcast uh, that we did recently saying basically, you know, the lockdown that they put in place, uh, the fever clinics that they have set up uh, in the affected areas, the fact that they were able to construct in 10 days time a, a hospital from nothing uh, and all these other things that are, are widely seen as uh, measures that would be very hard to replicate in other places, you know, a success by and large and probably saved an awful lot of people. On the other side, there are people who, say, who, who would argue that what was quintessentially Chinese was not all that, but more that they were not transparent at the outset uh, or not as transparent as they could have been. They uh, uh, didn't listen to whistleblowers, punished some of them perhaps. Um, and so I wonder whether you have your own views because you can't have lived as long as, as you did in China and not watch something like this, obviously with great interest. Um, where would you fall? What observations do you have uh, as you've watched what's going on in China right now? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I would just note, yeah, I was also there in 2003 during the SARS, the SARS virus yeah. and watched the response to that as well. Um, you know, I think 
uh, finally, both, both things are true. They started with uh, a, tre a tremendously damaging cover-up. Um, mm -hmm. we, know, we know sort of the dimensions of it. We had a doctor who in a small uh, WeChat group uh, was warning other doctors that there was a very strange pneumonia in their hospital. And he was punished. He was reprimanded. He was called in by the public security, the police, and said, uh, you're spreading dangerous rumors. It's bad for social stability. And there's, that's, that you can be punished for that in China. And uh, he basically signed something saying, I re retract that. A recent research that's just come out suggests that if they had identified uh, the severity of the coronavirus three, or three weeks earlier, there would have been 95% fewer infections. Mm -hmm. uh, one week was you know, something 60% fewer infections. Mm -hmm. uh, so people, many people got sick, and frankly, people died because of the initial cover-up. Uh, and so that was, that's really quite awful what happened then. And th they paid for it, and, and frankly, we're paying for it. Around, it's an issue around the world as the coronavirus spreads. Um, after they decided uh, that they were going to treat this more seriously, but by the way, in the interim as well, they had, uh, they had their biggest political meeting of the year in Wuhan, the Wuhan right. Party Congress. Uh, part of the reason it seems that they did not announce it earlier was because they wanted to get their political meeting done, which is very important to them. They had a huge banquet that brought in tens of thousands of families. Mm -hmm. um, and at that time, officials knew that there was a problem. Right. So I find that reprehensible. Uh, the second stage, something very different. Um, right. The mass mobilizations, the lockdowns, uh, the, the halt to transportation, the halt to the economy, basically, uh, no doubt stemmed the spread of this, uh, yeah. the spread of the disease. And that's something, um, you know, uh, the, the mass testing, which, you know, here in the United States, by, by con contrast, uh, we're doing a tr atrocious job at. Yeah. We don't know how serious it is because we're not testing anyone uh, or we're testing very few people so far. Um, those are all things that we could actually learn from. Right. And, and I, I really don't want to make this, this conversation all about this issue. But there was one nugget uh, that the WHO official who went uh, really mentioned and stuck with me, which is, I don't know the name of these. They're very, very high, uh, uh, you know, high quality ventilators that uh, I guess are, are super important when you have people who do have the disease or, or any kind of high grade pneumonia, even, even dangerous flu uh, that are, uh, once they're not gonna, you know, they're not gonna prevent it, but they're gonna help save your life uh, potentially. He said that uh, in a good US hospital, and he's seen his share. Three, four, five is about the right number. He said every hospital he went to uh, in the affected areas had about 40 or 50 of these. And I, you know, is that the kind of thing that surprises you in terms of medical infrastructure that exists there? Uh, or I, I'm not, I don't, I, don't, I don't want to put you on the spot. No, but, uh, no, I, I think, oh, I mean, first of all, he, he went to exactly the hospitals they chose for him to see. Sure. And the idea that most hospitals in China are uh, outfitted with that right, kind of technology right. is just, it's just not, it's just it's not a fact. It's yeah. not true. I mean, one of the things I deal with in my book is the, the great gap between rural right. health care and urban health care, and right. it's dramatically different. Right. So I think... Um, again, urban hospitals can be very impressive in China. They, yeah. and, and it's all, it's happened, actually it happened in the years that I was living there. They yeah. weren't very impressive in the 90s when I arrived. Yeah. Now, it must be a very strange experience, I would think, for you to, uh, I actually worked for just a couple of years as a journalist in Russia, and right after I left, this will betray my age, but right after I left, uh, there was a, um, uh, Boris Yeltsin was in power and there was a, you know, almost a civil war in Russia. The parliament was attacked and all this. But what's it like to have been there for 20 years and then see from a distance uh, this just colossal story, which of course now is a global story. It's not just a China story. Uh, did you have any, beyond the things we've talked about already, any just, any thoughts uh, given your experience and your knowledge of the government and the society and everything else as you've watched this unfold? Well, I, I mean, one, if there's, I have a real concern. I have many friends. I have relatives in China as well. Yeah. And uh, they, they've been dealing with uh, 
these lockdowns and, and fears of the, fears for their health. So, so it's it's personal in that sense. Uh, the uh, I uh, it's uh, as as working as a journalist there. Frankly, sometimes we I felt like we were lurching from disaster to you know sure. to amazing economic success. There was, as I said, I covered SARS. Um, yeah. Um, you know, I covered China's entry to the World Trade Organization um, and sort of back and forth. So um, I don't really have more to say about it than that. I'm very concerned um, I, and uh, I'm very pleased to see what uh, appears to be uh, China starting to get a handle mm-hmm. on this. Yep. At least in the cities. So let's get to your book um, and let's start with a really fundamental question. It's a, it's a provocative title, The Myth of Chinese Capitalism. Explain what you mean. What, what, what's the myth in your view? So the myth, uh, the myth of my title, sort of broadly speaking, is that China is becoming more capitalistic. What do I mean by capitalistic? Really what I'm saying is that the very impressive reform path that they set upon with Deng Xiaoping and continued with China's entry into the World Trade Organization way back in 2001, uh, uh, is going to c- keep continuing. And what we've seen in the last few years, the last five years, particularly since uh, the new leadership, took, the last leadership took over under Xi Jinping, is a real stalling of that reform. Mm-hmm. Um, another myth that I'm looking at, or that I, that I think I'm examining and I believe is, is a myth, is this idea that China will continue to keep growing its middle class. Depending on how you count it, it's you know, several hundred million strong. People have yep. different ways of counting the middle class. Um, there's been this sense that uh, we saw, we did see a tremendous uh, improvement in living standards in the cities and many people move into the middle class. This idea that, that this will now continue right. into the countryside, into the uh, lack of a better ex- uh, expression, the other China, mm-hmm. the migrant workers mm-hmm. and the farmers, I think is very much suspect. I do not see that happening. Yeah. Uh, so m- maybe if I can go, uh, before we burrow into that and the stats and, and everything else, to a Maybe a, a slightly outsider's, maybe even slightly superficial question, but as an occasional visitor to China, right? Chinese capitalism doesn't seem like a myth at all. It seems like everywhere, I mean, not everywhere, because those of us who go infrequently and go for short periods of time typically don't go to the rural areas that you spend a great deal of time in, you know, uh, in the book. Um, but, you know, it's hard, even when you just go at one year or two year increments, to not be stunned by, pick your metric, you know, just the incredible uh, burst of construction, high-speed rail, infrastructure that we wish as Americans, right, that that we had, um, the ability to take, you know, what's happened recently to just suddenly uh, put up a hospital in 10 days. Um, So a good deal of your book is really about what we're missing, those of us who visit, even if we visit with relative frequency, when we think well, there's no myth here? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, undeniably, there's been, you know, tremendous progress. They, they made a goal of uh, eliminating absolute poverty, I think, this year, and they're basically on track to do that. They have a centennial goal uh, next year, which will be the 100th anniversary of the Communist they're Party. They're very good at setting goals. Right? Yes, yeah, they are, yeah. yes, and often meeting them. And this goal yeah. is to... Um, have average per capita income uh, be ten thousand dollars, and mm-hmm. it's going to be a little tougher now with the uh, with the virus and the downturn in the economy. Mm-hmm. But they're close if they don't actually make it, mm-hmm. and it, they'll probably make it shortly after that. So, and there's been a, you know an explosion of wealth in the cities. Um, so what I'm arguing in my book, and what I see is the myth, is the idea that this tremendous progress that we have seen, including in infrastructure, high-speed rail, has really translated into benefiting the whole population, or even most of the population. It really, um, I argue, uh, is something that has had a tremendously positive impact on about half the people's people's lives there. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's things that are happening that, it's also been, it's also been accompanied, frankly, by you know, a massive explosion in income and, and uh, wealth inequality, mm-hmm. which, is, which is alarming to the leadership themselves because they, they know that people aren't always, that can actually cause social tensions, and it is causing social tensions mm-hmm. in China. 
So, so, and that last thing also would surprise, I think, you know, occasional readers, viewers, what have you, in this country and other parts of the world, because, again, I mentioned in the introduction, and you mentioned early on in your book, the implicit bargain is your phrase that was put forward by Deng Xiaoping, what are we now, 30, almost 40 years ago. Yeah, almost 40. That uh, you're, you're a citizen of China, uh, you agree to not uh, push the envelope much uh, as an individual or certainly in a group of any kind in terms of civil rights, political rights, and so forth. In return, uh, our bargain is your, your, uh, you know, your livelihood, your uh, way of life, your material uh, situation uh, will, will be lifted. And I guess from what you just said and what you say in the book, the bargain is... Uh, uh, has worked for a great many people, but then a great many people not. Is that right? Yes. I mean, and, it, you know, it's actually, and it was working for most people mm -hmm. for a long time. Um, and, but what, what I see is that uh, it, was, it has been very effective. It has been a bargain that the, the urban middle class have absolutely bought into. And one, one of the myths I look at as well is this idea that with rising living standards, and, uh, um, and uh, higher education levels, people are going to start to demand more uh, civil rights. That was Bill Clinton's uh, thesis, uh, Absolutely. Wasn't it? Yeah. When he, when he, when he, um, you know, he had his justification for lifting uh, uh, or giving China most favored uh, mm -hmm. nation mm -hmm. trading status. Uh, so this has been the sort of the implicit assumption that those of us that have hoped that there would be civil, uh, uh, political reform to follow economic reform have had about China, and. The fact is, it just really, it, it really hasn't happened. And mm -hmm. there's actually some very interesting research, which I talk about in my book, uh, which looks at the fact that basically the, rich, the richer Chinese people, the better off Chinese people become and better educated, the less likely they are to actually protest anything or, or try to demand more civil rights. Probably so, true in a lot of places. Yeah, I think right? it's probably true in a lot of places. But, I, you know, and I was guilty of it at one point as well. This, it was this sort of assumption, this... You know, the NIMBY argument, not in my backyard. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You get yourself an apartment and you know, your life's good and then a factory starts polluting next to you and you're going to tell the government you can't have that factory there. And there was a lot of right. envi the environmental movement in China started to a degree from that. Um, but that's just not the case today in China. And that is mm -hmm. one of the things I mention is, it, interestingly enough, some of the protests that we have seen by urban Chinese has been actually resistance to the reform of policies to allow more migrant children to enter the schools. Mm -hmm. So the urban parents who are like, the last thing, you know, it's already hard enough to get myself, my child into a good right. school. The last thing I want to do is to allow the rest of China to have the same rights. Talk a little bit about protest movements in China. That's another thing that, you know, I, I would venture that nine out of 10, maybe 99 out of 100, People who don't go to China much, even if they read occasionally about it, think, well, that's, that this just doesn't happen, right? But we know uh, that, that it does. And I also, you know, it, it, it's, it's, if there's a cliche there, born of Tiananmen or, or Hong Kong, it's that if there are going to be protests, it's for uh, greater democracy. Mm. It's not true, really, is it? I mean, what, talk a bit about what you have seen and learned over the years about protest in China. Mm -hmm. In the mainland. Yeah, well, what I do look at a lot in the book and what I w looked at a lot as a reporter before is labor protests. Right. Ro protests between uh, the migrant workers and the management of these factories for, um, in some cases, you know, very bad abuses that they've, that they've, uh, that they've faced in the factories. Um, and, those fa and those kinds of protests, by the way, continue virtually every day. Right. Um, and it's almost a... Uh, it's been a, a contest for the party to try to uh, make sure that they stay localized, to make mm -hmm. sure that they don't link up across uh, different companies, even worse, uh, you know, different industries, or cross regionally. So China's, mm -hmm. the government and the party's become very effective at basically isolating protests. Um, typically what they would do is, uh, as a, another scholar referred to, use a combination of repression and responsiveness. So they would go in there and they would... Uh, see what the problem was, the workers aren't being paid enough, they try to get the factory managers to pay them more, but at the same time they figure out who actually organized this protest. Mm -hmm. And they would give them, you know, very, diff very often very um, uh, extreme sentences, put them in jail as a warning to the rest of them. So 
So they, they've both, they were approached them in both ways. Um, but I guess the bigger point is those protests continue. Um, and, uh, you know, they haven't gone away even when we don't hear about them. Right. Um, some of the larger ones have been, have been contained. Uh, I, I write about in the book these massive protests around uh, factories that were Adidas right. suppliers. Right. And uh, that sort of thing we haven't seen in a number of years. But I find it hard to believe that uh, we won't see more of that going forward, particularly as the economy continues to slow, which right. I'm quite sure it will. Yeah. That's when the implicit bargain, it wasn't serving the rural people or the migrants as well in the first place. Yep. And it, it, it just starts to fray a bit as yep. the economy slows. And there's a lot of things behind that. But maybe this is a good moment just to, uh, to ask you to talk a little bit about, because there's a, there's a lot of different ways you could have written a book and told the story of what we're talking about. Um, I, I think it's impressive and interesting that you chose not just some interesting individuals, but also it seems like the main characters really are places. And um, I hope I get the pronunciation right, but uh, those main characters would be, in one case, the village of Binghua Chun uh, and the sprawling mm -hmm. city of Dongwan, the village where... Uh, it, you know, dirt poor, uh, and and for reasons anyone can understand, whether they've been in China or not, people who want to get somewhere where they have a chance at a better livelihood, and then Dongwan, a destination for many of those and other migrants, uh, really uh, a kind of dateline for the juggernaut of Chinese manufacturing and everything else. Talk a little bit about um, those places and how you came to make them main characters in your book. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the first time I, well, the first year that I visited both of those places was 2000. And, uh, and how long had you been in China at that point? You'd I'd been, been in China for five years. I was yeah. actually 23 years in China. Okay. Uh, so I'd been in China for five years. Um, 1999, China and the U.S. signed the bilateral right. accession agreement to the WTO. Uh, we knew that China was entering in, in 2001 because that agreement between the U.S. and China was the key one. Other countries had to sign agreements, but now that the U.S. and China had it settled, uh, it was going forward. And uh, everyone was, there was sort of this ferment about how WTO can change China and not just change uh, factory towns, which were quite small, much smaller mm -hmm. then, but also the interior as uh, yeah. money and, and investment and managerial know-how would flow into China. And so I went down there. I was doing a story specifically on the, it was a cover story for Business Week magazine. It was called The Great Migration. So I wanted to, I went there to see migrants who worked in factories who also came and, and also mm -hmm. hoped to see their villages. And uh, went to Dongguan. I think it was, I'd been to Dongguan before covering the growth of the Taiwanese community that were basically make up the factory managers yep. there before, I think the year before. So it was maybe my second visit. Um, but I went there this time to talk to the, to the workers and found, met these workers and, uh, they were uh, extremely interesting and, and good peop open people. And um, next thing I knew, a, a couple months later, I was heading back to their village in Guizhou, to the place you mentioned, yeah. Binghua Sun, to meet them. And uh, this was a real uh, eye-opener for me. If you remember back then, it was also uh, in China, there was a lot of attention on the, the, early, on the internet boom sweeping China and a lot of media, including Business Week, where I worked. Another thing that they thought was going to change the whole country. That's right. right. That's right. And I just, for whatever, my own preferences was not really that interested. <laughs> I, I, didn't, I didn't go to China to you know, write yeah. about people that had done their Harvard MBAs and returning Chinese <laughs> and got, worked at McKinsey and then decided to start a company. So I, was, I, I specifically was interested in meeting these people that I had some contact with, but and more importantly, I knew they were out there and I knew they were important to the economic model of China. So anyway, I went there and th th I went to Dongguan, I went to Binghua Sun, and uh, both those places, uh, you know, they, they, they fit the bill. They, 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 that was the migrant model back yeah. then. Yeah. Huh. And how many times, uh, how much time ultimately would you say you spent in these places? Because it certainly seems from the book like it's a lot. Yeah, I, you know, I've actually lost track of the number of times I visited. Um, uh, I visited the village, you know, many times. I visited Dongguan dozens and dozens of times, yeah. uh, and for other stories as well. Um, and just, uh, just quickly, those places are very relevant today for China. As China, so uh, maybe we're getting—I'm getting ahead of us. But, okay. but, 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 
Now, now the idea is, as, as, China, as the Chinese economic model tries to change, as factories are automated, yeah. these same migrant workers are trying to sort of reinvent themselves, and they're being told by the government in no uncertain terms, it's time to go home and figure right. out a new way right. to, to function. So places like Bing Hua Tsun today is trying to reinvent itself, in, in their case, as sort of a, almost an ecotourism place, which would be wonderful, because it's a beautiful place. Mm -hmm. It has wonderful food, by the way, spicy food from Guizhou, and uh, uh, a, little, a little similar to what, you know, the Chuan Sai, Sichuan food. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very, it's just stunningly beautiful. These green mountains, sort of karst, uh, karst mountains, like in neighboring Guangxi. Yeah. So usually when there's reinvention of that sort done in China, from my limited experience, government has a hand in it. I remember about the same time, actually, about 20 years ago, uh, I went to, um, to China and we were uh, focused on what was then, you know, still a, a kind of new world of getting out of the old state-run factories in some places. And we were invited uh, to visit as journalists with um, people who were, I don't know, you know, widget factory number two or, or what have you in, in Shanghai. And they brought us to, the, to a restaurant where all these people were just being picked up basically, because that was a dead industry and said, here, you're going to work in the service sector, and you are going to be a cook, and you are going to be a waiter, and you are going to be this, this. So when you go back to the village, did they dream up the ecotourism, or did the government say, hey, this is going to be a good thing for you to find some success? I think, I think with encouragement from the government, um, mm -hmm. Guizhou was basically anointed a, a tourism right, center. Right. Um, not only that, they have, it's also supposed to be the big data center for China. So you have this... Uh, sort of these awesome, this awesome uh, 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 business park outside the capital city mm -hmm. where you have big investors, the big top China uh, telecom companies, China Mobile, China Telecom. Mm -hmm. You have Foxconn, the, the supplier oh, for right. Apple. They've all set up shop there, and that's very much government mandated. Mm -hmm. um, but also on the tourism side. So it's, it's really a combination. On the tourism side, you also have... Um, there's a program they have where they designate uh, a number of top state enterprises or successful companies, and they are supposed to go and mm -hmm. contribute to the national economic mm -hmm. health by investing in places like Guizhou. And they have been told in Guizhou to, to set up, e quote unquote, ecotourism. What it is, in fact, is in some cases these massive, sometimes garish uh, resorts that are right. spread around the country and frankly, I think they're going to struggle to actually fill them with tourists. Right. But a lot of that at least seems like it is a potential road for people who, you know, the migrant labor doesn't, doesn't work anymore. The model doesn't work as a potential road to something that could, you know, wend your way back into the Chinese middle class. But your book certainly suggests that road is, is fraught at the moment, right? Yes. Yes. I mean, so that's on the entrepreneurial side. There's all sorts of pitfalls. You know, I have friends who've gone back and have basically become bankrupt because they don't necessarily mm -hmm. have the skills to be um, business people. And uh, actually a lament I heard a lot from migrant friends of mine was, I just spent 20 years far from my village and I go back there and I'm a stranger and mm -hmm. I'm supposed to set up a business and you know, I don't even I even talk funny now because, because I you I learned all to, that. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and doesn't necessarily always mean a successful model. And that's on the entrepreneurial side. On the service side, uh, there's been this hope from the government that uh, yes, that a large number they want to they want to make a more service driven economy, more consumption economy. And there's been this idea that somehow they will find better paying service jobs. Um, mm -hmm. They can be trained for them, and whether it's in you know online commerce companies or developing apps for mobile phones, they're supposedly s supposed to do that. But the reality is much of the service j jobs that they've done are very low end. And, right. and um, I mean, one of the most common jobs you now see in the big cities is motorcycle delivery people. Sure. And it's a brutal business. They, yeah. they, you know, they're paid by how many, how many packages they deliver. They have no time to ha eat. Right. They have no right. time to stop. As a result, there's a terrible... Uh, online occupational uh, safety issue. There's all these terrible traffic yeah. accidents. Yeah, yeah. And that's probably, that's in the cities, that's the most common new migrant worker job. Right. 
And we skated past this before, but when you talk about a broken model for migrant labor and for places like Dongguan, yeah, I assume uh, a big part of that is that cheap labor, which was the calling card, right, for, for the incredible uh, growth in, in, in much of uh, certainly that part of China, is now uh, they're getting beat in terms of the, ch the low price of labor mm. by the likes of Vietnam, Bangladesh, right? I mean, is that... Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you, this might even be surprising. Mexico and Malaysia now are yeah. apparently cheaper yeah. for your average manufacturing wage. Right. So China, in an extent, you know, has priced themselves out of, out of that. Um, the, so this, 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 is, this is a real reason... This is a reason why they're trying to make this momentous economic shift right now. The old yeah. factory to the world model doesn't work. Right. They want to keep their manufacturing, by the way. They just want to automate it and bring in robots. And there's a whole uh, very um, detailed and very well-financed government plan to try mm -hmm. to drive the, uh, the automation of factories. Right. Now, I, I, I do want to... Um, well, actually, let me ask you another question before we get to some forecasting and some prognostication. Huh. When did you, what, you know, we, we have so many people who come to the Asia Society, uh, I mean, background in all kinds of countries. China certainly seems to lead the way uh, for whatever reason. Uh, and I always like to ask people who are not initially from China how they first got the bug or how they first went. And I know you studied, but when did you first go? When did you first sort of think, uh, was it as a student or as the, visit, the first visit you made that you kind of figured... Or maybe you didn't figure that you're going to be a 23-year guy in China. Yeah, well, I, you know, I, I started to study Chinese in Stanford, uh, right? At Stanford, yeah. um, and it, 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 this will date me, but it was it was so far back that my advisor told me you should study Japanese because that's where the economic future is. Uh, so it was the 80s. <laughs> we're, we're in the same vintage. <laughs> yeah. So, and I like to pretend, uh, although I always ad I never I always admit that this is not the case, but I like to say. Well, you, you, we might think that I, I was amazingly for, you know, far seen and I knew that China yeah. would become the world's second largest economy, which is you know, nonsense. I was really more just uh, stubborn and interested in China. Um, I'd started, I took an introductory class to Chinese philosophy and started to study Chinese politics and economics. So that was at, in college. Um, right after graduation, I continued language studies in Taipei. Mm -hmm. That was back when Taipei was still... Now most students from the United States would probably, almost all of them, go to the, the mainland. But back then it was different. So that was um, in 1988. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, fast forward, I did some time here in New York at graduate school and so on. Um, I, I uh, 90, in 95, I moved to Beijing and I uh, um, had decided that I wasn't going to become a professor, which I thought I might do at one point, mm -hmm. and I wanted to be a journalist. And so I headed to Beijing. Yeah. Wow. Timing is everything. Right? <laughs> yeah. So l let's do a little forecasting before we wrap things here. Um, I, you, you get the sense, not only from what you're saying here, but, but from your book, that there's some dark clouds on this horizon that even before the coronavirus, has, well, before the coronavirus, has seemed very rosy for China, uh, whether it's journalists writing about it, scholars writing about it. Um, and uh, you've mentioned some of the reasons for that, uh, income inequality being a big one, some you know, social unrest or whatever. Uh, that said, we've had an awful lot of people on this stage at the Asia Society over the years who, for whatever reason, mm. have said, you know, uh, those rough times are coming for China and bubbles are going to burst and what have you, and yet there seems... To you know, year after year, they seem to whether they make their GDP mark or whatever, uh, the uh, the doomsayers are proven wrong often. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. So uh, not that you're f prognosticating doom, but uh, why convince our audience that uh, uh, that they should be not so bullish on China at the moment. So the argument that I make in the book, and I, and I believe, is that China's facing really the biggest economic transition since Deng Xiaoping, and that's mm -hmm. moving from this investment-driven uh, factory-to-the-world model uh, and uh, based on selling relatively low-cost goods to the world. And uh, that, of course, as, we, as we've discussed, has been based on, on uh, low-cost labor, and that, that model is no longer viable. 
And the Chinese government, you know, to give them absolute credit, they're very aware of this. Right. They, they know that they have to shift. Right. It's extremely ambitious. They want to move to a far more domestic consumption-driven economy, a far more service-driven economy. They also want to move up the tech ladder, so they're producing uh, you know, goods of, uh, of a far higher technology content that it can be globally competitive. Um, so the argument of, my, argument of my book is that's a wonderful thing to do, and, and, I, and I wish them success in it. I, I don't think it's possible for them to actually become uh, a high-tech company, that, I'm, I'm sorry, a high-tech uh, economy that's globally successful, producing these you know, globally uh, competitive uh, goods uh, in technology, as, um, and most importantly, uh, be uh, uh, powered to a great degree by the domestic economy if about half the population is systematic, so systematically left out. Mm -hmm. And that's just not on the, on the income level. Right. And they can't spend, so they can't become the consumers to replace the world's consumers to a degree. But they're also getting education that's, that's very bad. Right. I, right. We have, the Chinese government won't, um, uh, won't you know, fess up to some of, some of these numbers, but independent researchers that have done very rigorous work in the Chinese mm -hmm. countryside mm -hmm. find that dropout rates in high school for rural mm -hmm. kids are extremely high. You know, there may be, right. it may be something like 25% of, of people with rural hukou right. are finishing high school, according to some people's estimates. Um, you can't have a population where half of the people are being left behind. They don't have a lot of money to spare. They're getting poorly educated. Their health may not be very good. Yep. Yep. Um, and, and expect this transition to succeed. Yeah. And so I always come back to that. I also have seen the tremendous progress. I've seen all the problems as well. But I come back to that. I just don't think it's possible. Mm -hmm. And again, they know they need to change this. Yeah. Um, they did announce, I mean, part of it is, uh, again, these, there's a couple crucial policies, the household registration policy or the HUCO policy that is, re is responsible for people getting far worse you know, education and, and health care. The dual land system, which makes it very mm -hmm. difficult for people in the countryside to monetize their land. They, back in 2013, at one of their third plenum meetings, there was this bold blueprint for growth, right. which basically saw these policies done away with. And they've yeah. made virtually no progress. Yeah. Um, and I guess the, the, the migrant labor model being, you know, uh, so problematic now. I mean, there's not much to migrate for anymore, right? I mean, there is, but it's not... So to what extent has that, uh, do the villagers in, in the village, and I'm now being, being watched, watching, sorry. to what extent do they, uh, would you say, do they still want to uh, go someplace else? And is it just a matter that there isn't an obvious place to go to anymore? Or are they trying to make a go of it with all these new industries that are in the province that you Many mentioned? of them are... Would are would love to or are happy if they already have have I mean they're they're trying to make a go of it back in their hometowns right, right. and most of the people that I first met in the Moes that I first met in two thousand told me at the time yeah all I want to see is my village develop and someday after slaving away you know doing this this very difficult work in the factories I want to save enough money to go back right and start right. a little business or do something so they would like to be there yeah. Um, so that's not uh, in, in my, not all not all of them. There's another there's another person in my book, uh, Rubois, who had no right. intention to ever go back. So right. he's trying to still trying to make a go of it in the city. Um, but the problem isn't necessarily that they have to go back to their village. It's it's just really unclear how they yeah. can make an economic go of it now. Yeah, is there anything I'm putting on the spot in all these ways? Because you're not an ep epidemiologist and you're not an advisor to the government. Is there something you think the Chinese ought to be doing or could be doing that would mitigate against some of these problems you're talking about that might, you know, if you put, put yourself in the, in yes. the next plenum meeting or, I mean, what, yes. what, yeah. Well, you know, I think they, they've actually, they've actually mapped out the path ahead mm -hmm. they, they, mm -hmm. in the 2013 third plenum. They, they, um, they've spent a lot of money on trying to improve rural health care and education, which is admirable. A lot right. of money. Right. Um, I would argue that the thing that they, that they absolutely need to do, and they've done very little on, is simply to end these policies. The, 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 the household registration or the HUCO policy the HUCO, yeah. and the dual land system. And actually allow people 
to work where they want to work, right. bring their children right. there with them, let their children, you know, some of this costs money, some of it doesn't. There's an argument about how much money it costs to bring, yep. integrate migrants into the city and their families. Some policymakers in China think that actually they're, they're very hardworking, they'll, they'll generate taxes and it, can, mm -hmm. it doesn't have to cost that much. But there's this fear that it costs too much and that's a problem. Um, so I would say stepping away and saying, okay, these policies were created in the 50s in, in both cases. Mm -hmm. They're ancient history, and they've done a very good job at moving away from other uh, legacy yep. policies. Yep. Why keep um, these? And why keep these? And there's a, there's a, we could get into why. There's a number of reasons, I think, why it's difficult. Yeah. But that's what they need to do. But well, without all those reasons, any what, what would you say? Is there any chance that those are going to... I mean, they're not, afraid, th they're not afraid of taking you know, stark measures when they feel the, the, the leadership, when they feel... Seven necessary. years ago... They, yeah. told, uh, they told their country and they told the, the foreign journalists, they, the people that were paying attention that were not from their country, that they were going to, yeah. to quickly move to yeah. reform them step by step. And, and, and here we are. Yeah, and here we are. I, I, there is, there's a number of issues. Um, it's uh, the, the localities, the cities don't want to pay the new social welfare costs of integrating the migrants. Right. Um, a big one, and I mentioned this briefly earlier, is Urban people in China are not really ready to see their schools and their medical clinics um, suddenly filled with a lot of people that previously were not allowed in. Right, right. So before we uh, wrap things here, you're at the University of uh, Montana now. Your your uh, native land, I guess you would say. Yeah, where uh, I was what, born. What, and what, what are you doing now, and what are you going to do next, or have you not figured that out yet? Well, I'm trying to figure that out. But I, uh, so I'm a, a fellow at a. There's a. There's the Marine and Mike Mansfield Center, which is yeah. a very nice, yeah. uh, great place, uh, Asian Studies Center there. Great American and, diplomat. Yeah. That's right. That's right. And uh, uh, a, a nice community of uh, Asian scholars there at the university, mm -hmm. and. Uh, now, I've, the main thing I've been focused on for the last year and a half is getting this book done. And finally, it's out uh, to, as of earlier this week. And so uh, the future, you know, the future is unwritten. We'll have to see. I, maybe, maybe another book. Good, good. We look forward to it. Again, uh, the book is The Myth of Chinese Capitalism, The Worker, the Factory, and the Future of the World. Dexter Roberts, great to have you with us at the Asia Society. Thank you. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it.